From Salt Lake City, Utah, this is the Saturday evening session of the 190th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music for this session is provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast is furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited. President Dallin H. Oaks, first counselor in the first presidency of the church, will conduct this session. We welcome you to this special Saturday evening session of the 190th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, in which we gather to commemorate the restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ here upon the earth. We welcome members and friends everywhere who are viewing this meeting. The music for this session, which has been pre-recorded, will be provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square under the direction of various conductors and organists. The choir will open this meeting by singing, Let Zion in Her Beauty Rise. The invocation will then be offered by Elder Kyle S. McKay of the Seventy. The choir will then sing, Lead Kindly Light. Our Father in heaven, we pause at the beginning of this historic session of conference during this historic season of this earth to give thee thanks for thy son. We are grateful that his mission, his very nature is not to condemn but to save, for we need saving. We thank thee for coming with him to usher in the restoration of the fullness of the gospel. We are grateful for the prophet Joseph we are grateful for the prophet Russell M. Nelson. We revere them both, as we do all who have held or will yet hold 
the priesthood keys necessary to govern thy church and to roll on this kingdom. We pray now that those who have prepared in spirit might be magnified in spirit, that their minds may be clear, their tongues will be loosed, that our minds and hearts will be open so that we can be edified and rejoice together by thy word and through thy spirit. We invoke thy Holy Spirit with this commitment that we will act promptly and righteously in response to the promptings and directions we receive from thy Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.
We will now be pleased to hear from Elder Garrett W. Gong of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. He will be followed by Sister Laudy R. Kauk, a young woman in the Slate Canyon 14th Ward, Provo, Utah Stake, and Brother Enzo S. Patello, a priest in the Meadowwood Ward, Provo, Utah, Edgemont Stake. Sister Jean B. Bingham, Relief Society General President, will then address us. Dear brothers and sisters, with Hosanna and Hallelujah, we celebrate the living Jesus Christ at this season of continuing restoration and Easter. With perfect love, our Savior assures us, in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Some years ago, as Sister Gong and I met a lovely family, their young daughter Ivy shyly brought out her violin case. She lifted out the violin bow, tightened and put rosin on it. Then she put the bow back in the case, curtsied, and sat down. A new beginner, she had just shared all she knew about the violin. Now, years later, Ivy plays the violin beautifully. In this mortal period, we are all a little like Ivy and her violin. We begin at the beginning. With practice and persistence, we grow and improve. With the passage of time, moral agency and mortal experiences help us become more like our Savior as we labor with him in his vineyard and follow his covenant path. Anniversaries, including this bicentennial, highlight patterns of restoration in celebrating the ongoing restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We also prepare for Easter. In both, we rejoice in the return of Jesus Christ. He lives, not only then but now, not just for some, but for all. He came and comes to heal the brokenhearted, deliver the captives, recover sight to the blind, and set at liberty those who are bruised. That's each of us. His redeeming promises apply, no matter our past, our present, or concerns for our future. Tomorrow is Palm Sunday. Traditionally, palms are a sacred symbol to express joy in our Lord. As in Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, much people took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him. You may be interested to know the original of this beloved Harry Anderson painting hangs in President Russell M. Nelson's office just behind his desk. In the book of Revelations, those who praise God and the Lamb do so clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Along with robes of righteousness and crowns of glory, palms are included in the Kirtland Temple dedicatory prayer. Of course, the significance of Palm Sunday goes beyond crowds greeting Jesus with palms. On Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem in ways the faithful recognized as fulfillment of prophecy. As Zechariah and the psalmist prophetically, prophetically foretold, our Lord entered Jerusalem riding a colt as multitudes knowingly cried, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna means save now. Then as now we rejoice. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. A week following Palm Sunday is Easter Sunday. President Nelson teaches Jesus Christ came to pay a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. Indeed, through the atonement of Christ, all God's children may be saved by obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. At Easter, we sing hallelujah. Hallelujah means praise ye the Lord Jehovah, the Hallelujah Chorus in Handel's Messiah is a beloved Easter declaration that he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The sacred events between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday are the story of Hosanna and Hallelujah. Hosanna is our plea for God to save. Hallelujah expresses our praise to the Lord for the hope of salvation and exaltation. In Hosanna and Hallelujah, 
we recognize the living Jesus Christ as the heart of Easter and Latter-day Restoration. Latter-day Restoration begins with Theophany, the literal appearance of God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, to the young prophet Joseph Smith. Said the prophet Joseph, could you gaze into heaven five minutes? You would know more than you would by reading all that was ever written on the subject. Because the heavens are again open, we know and believe in God the Eternal Father and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost, the Divine Godhead. On Easter Sunday, April 3, 1836, in the early days of the Restoration, the living Jesus Christ appeared when the Kirtland Temple was dedicated. Those who saw him there testified of him in complementary contrasts of fire and water. His eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun and his voice was the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah. On that occasion, our Savior declared, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Again, complementary contrasts, first and last, living and slain. He is Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end, the author and finisher of our faith. Following the appearance of Jesus Christ, Moses, Elias, and Elijah also came. By divine direction, these great prophets of old restored priesthood keys and authority. Thus, the keys of this dispensation are committed within his restored church to bless all God's children. The coming of Elijah in the Kirtland Temple also fulfilled Malachi's Old Testament prophecy that Elijah would return before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. In doing so, Elijah's appearance coincided, though not by coincidence, with the Jewish Passover season, which tradition reverently anticipates Elijah's return. Many devout Jewish families set a place for Elijah at their Passover table. Many fill a cup to the brim to invite and welcome him. And some, during the traditional Passover Seder, send a child to the door, sometimes left partly open, to see if Elijah is outside waiting to be invited in. In fulfillment of prophecy, and as part of the restored and promised restoration of all things, Elijah did come as promised at Easter and the onset of Passover. He brought the sealing authority to bind families on earth and in heaven. As Moroni taught the prophet Joseph, Elijah shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers. If it were not so, Moroni continued, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at the Lord's coming. The spirit of Elijah, a manifestation of the Holy Ghost, draws us to our generations, past, present, and future, in our genealogies, histories, and temple service. Let us also briefly recall what Passover signifies. Passover remembers the deliverance of the children of Israel from 400 years of bondage. The book of Exodus relates how this deliverance came after plagues of frogs, lice, flies, the death of cattle, boils, blains, hail and fire, locusts and thick darkness. The final plague threatened the death of the firstborn in the land, but not in the house of Israel, if. If those households put the blood of an unblemished firstling lamb on the lentils of their doors. The angel of death passed by the houses marked with the symbolic blood of the lamb. That passing by, or Passover, represents Jesus Christ ultimately overcoming death. Indeed, the atoning blood of the Lamb of God gives our Good Shepherd power to gather his people in all places and circumstances into the safety of his fold on both sides of the veil. Significantly, the Book of Mormon describes the power and resurrection of Christ, the essence of Easter, in two terms of two 
restorations. First, resurrection includes physical restoration of our proper and perfect frame. Every limb and joint, even a hair of the head, shall not be lost. This promise gives hope to those who have lost limbs, who have lost ability to see, hear, or walk, or those thought lost to relentless disease, mental illness, or other diminished capacity. He finds us. He makes us whole. A second promise of Easter in our Lord's Atonement is that spiritually, all things shall be restored to their proper order. This spiritual restoration reflects our works and desires. Like bread upon the water, it restores that which is good, righteous, just, and merciful. No wonder the prophet Alma uses the word restore 22 times as he urges us to deal justly, judge righteously, and do good continually. Because God himself atoneth for the sins of the world, the Lord's atonement can make whole not only what was, but what can be. Because he knows our pains, afflictions, sicknesses, our temptations of every kind, he can, with mercy, succor us according to our infirmities. Because God is a perfect, just God and a merciful God also, the plan of mercy can appease the demands of justice. We repent and do all we can. He encircles us eternally in the arms of his love. Today we celebrate restoration and resurrection. With you, I rejoice in the ongoing restoration of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. As began 200 years ago this spring, light and revelation continue to come forth through the Lord's living prophet and his church called in his name, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and through personal revelation and inspiration by the supernal gift of the Holy Ghost. With you, at this Easter season, I testify of God, our eternal Father, and his beloved Son, the living Jesus Christ. Mortal men were cruelly crucified and later resurrected but only the living Jesus Christ in his perfect resurrected form still bears the marks of crucifixion in his hands, feet, and side. Only he can say, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Only he can say, I am he who was lifted up. I am Jesus that was crucified. I am the Son of God. Like little Ivy and her violin, we are in some ways still beginning. Truly I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of men the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. In these times, we can learn much of God's goodness and our divine potential for God's love to grow in us as we seek him and reach out to others. In new ways and new places, we can do and become, line upon line, kindness upon kindness, individually and together. Dear brothers and sisters everywhere, as we meet and learn together, your faith and goodness fill me with a sense of gospel adventure and gratitude. Your testimony and gospel journey enrich my testimony and gospel journey. Your concerns and joys, your love for the household of God and community of saints, and your lived understanding of restored truth and life increase my fullness of restored gospel with the living Jesus Christ at its heart. Together we trust, through cloud and sunshine, Lord, abide with me. Unitedly we know, amidst our loads and cares, we can count our many blessings. In the daily details of small and simple things, we can see great things brought to pass in our lives. And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from all nations 
and shall come to Zion, singing with songs of everlasting joy. At this season of Hosanna and Hallelujah, sing Hallelujah, for he shall reign forever and ever. Shout Hosanna to God and the Lamb. In the sacred and holy name of Jesus Christ, amen. I'm grateful to be here. When I first found out I would have the opportunity to speak to you today, I felt very excited, but at the same time, very humbled. I spent a lot of time thinking about what I could share, and I hope the Spirit speaks to you directly through my message. In the Book of Mormon, Lehi gives a blessing to each of his sons before he passes away that helps them to see their strengths and eternal potential. I am the youngest of eight children, and this past year, I've been the only child at home for the first time. Not having my siblings close by or always having someone to talk to has been hard for me. There have been nights when I felt very lonely. I'm grateful for my parents who have tried their best to help me. An example of this is when my dad offered to give me a priesthood blessing of comfort during a particularly challenging time. After his blessing, things didn't change right away, but I was able to feel peace and love from my Heavenly Father and from my dad. I feel blessed to have a worthy father who can provide priesthood blessings whenever I need them and who helps me to see my strengths and internal potential just as Lehi did when he blessed his children. Regardless of your circumstances, you can always have access to priesthood blessings through family members, friends, ministering brothers, priesthood leaders, and a heavenly father that will never fail you, you can receive the blessings of the priesthood. Elder Neil L. Anderson said, the blessings of the priesthood are infinitely greater than the one who is asked to administer the gift. As we are worthy, the ordinance of the priesthood enrich our lives. Don't hesitate to ask for a blessing when you need extra guidance. It is in our difficult moments that we need the Spirit to help us the most. No one is perfect, and we all experience hardships. Some of us might suffer with anxiety, depression, addiction, or the feelings that we are not enough. Priesthood blessings can help us overcome these challenges and receive peace as we move forward into the future. I hope that we strive to live worthy of receiving these blessings. Another way the priesthood blesses us is through patriarchal blessings. I have, turned to turn, I have learned to turn to my patriarchal blessing whenever I feel sad or lonely. My blessing helps me to see my potential and the, the specific plan God has for me. It comforts me and helps me to see beyond my earthly perspective. It reminds me of my gifts and of the blessings I will receive if I live worthy. It also helps me to see to remember and feel at peace that God will provide answers and open doors for me at exactly the right moment when I need it most. Patriarchal blessings help us to return to live with our Heavenly Father. I know patriarchal blessings come from God and can help us turn our weaknesses into strengths. It isn't a message from a fortune teller. These blessings tell us what we need to hear. They're like a liahona for each one of us. When we put God first and have faith in him, he will lead us through our own wilderness. Just like God blessed Joseph Smith with the priesthood so that the blessings of the gospel could be restored, we can receive the blessings of the gospel in our lives through the priesthood. Each week, we are given the privilege and opportunity of taking the sacrament through this priesthood ordinance, we have the Spirit to always be with us, which can cleanse and purify us. If we feel the need to eliminate something from our lives, reach out to a trusted leader who can help you get on the right path. Your leaders can help you to access the full power of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Thanks to the priesthood, we can also receive the blessings of the ordinance of the temple. Ever since I've been able to enter the temple, I've made it a goal and priority to attend regularly. 
by taking the time and making the sacrifices necessary to be closer to my Heavenly Father in His holy house, I've been blessed with receiving revelation and promptings that have really helped me throughout my life. Through the priesthood, we can be lifted. The priesthood brings light into our world. Elder Robert D. Hells said, Without the power of the priesthood, the whole earth would be utterly wasted. There'd be no light, no hope, only darkness. God is cheering for us. He wants us to return to Him. He knows us personally. He knows you. He loves us. He's always aware of us and blesses us even when we feel we don't deserve it. He knows what we need and when we need it. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be open unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. If you don't already have a testimony about the priesthood, I encourage you to pray and to know for yourself of its power. Then read the scriptures to hear God's words. I know that if we make an effort to experience the power of God's priesthood in our lives, we will be blessed. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, I am truly grateful to speak to you on this historic evening about the sacred gift of the priesthood and the marvelous power it has to bless the youth in this dispensation. I pray that despite my imperfections, the Spirit will assist me in teaching truth. The First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve Apostles have reminded holders of the Aaronic Priesthood that you live in a day of great opportunities and challenges, a day in which the priesthood has been restored. You have the authority to administer the ordinances of the Aaronic Priesthood. As you prayerfully and worthily exercise that authority, you will greatly bless the lives of those around you. As the young men of the church, we are also reminded that we are beloved sons of God, and he has a work for us to do, and we assist in his work to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. The priesthood is the authority to administer the ordinances and covenants of the Savior's gospel to those who are worthy to receive them. Through these priesthood ordinances and sacred covenants comes the full blessings of the Savior's atonement that helps us achieve our divine destiny. Joseph Smith was a young man who was called of God to restore the gospel of Jesus Christ, and for that purpose was given the priesthood which he used to bless all mankind. Doctrine and Covenants, section 135, cites many of the blessings Joseph has given the youth of this dispensation. We read, Joseph Smith has done more, save Jesus only, for the salvation of men in this world than any other man that ever lived in it. He has brought forth the Book of Mormon, has sent the fullness of the everlasting gospel to the four quarters of the earth, has brought forth the revelations and commandments which compose the doctrine and covenants, gathered many thousands of the Latter-day Saints, and left a fame and name that cannot be slain. To effectively serve like Joseph did, we must worthily qualify to use the Lord's priesthood power. While translating the Book of Mormon, Joseph and Oliver Cowdery wanted to be baptized, but they lacked the proper authority. On May 15, 1829, they knelt in prayer and were visited by John the Baptist, who gave them the keys and authority of the Aaronic Priesthood, saying, Upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I confer the priesthood of Aaron, which holds the keys of the ministering of angels, and of the gospel of repentance, and of baptism by immersion, for the remission of sins. We are given the opportunity to minister like angels, to preach the gospel on all the continents of the earth, and to help souls come unto Christ. This service places us in joint labor with John the Baptist, Moroni, Joseph Smith, President Nelson, and other diligent servants of the Lord. Our service in and with his priesthood brings together those who are dedicated to following and living the Lord's teachings with exactness, which I personally know can be difficult as we face the challenges of youth. But uniting with these fellow servants of the Lord in accomplishing his work will help to strengthen us against the adversary's temptations and deceptions. You can become a beacon of light to all those who are unsure of themselves. The light within you will shine so bright that everyone you interact with will be blessed by just being in your company. It may be hard at times to acknowledge the presence of our spiritual companions, 
but I am grateful to know that I am a member of a faithful priesthood quorum with whom I can work to grow closer to Christ. Along with our friends and family, the Holy Ghost is one of our most loyal and reliable companions. But in order to invite his constant companionship, we must place ourselves in situations and places where he will want to be present. This can begin in our own home as we work to make it a holy place by participating in daily scripture study and prayer as a family and, more importantly, as we personally study the scriptures and pray on our own. Earlier this year, I was provided with an exciting yet humbling opportunity to help my little sister Osian progress on the covenant path by accepting the invitation to be baptized and fulfill one of the prescribed requirements to enter the celestial kingdom. She postponed her baptism one month until I was ordained a priest to give me the privilege to perform the ordinance while our other sisters were also privileged to work under priesthood assignment and stand as witnesses. As we stood on opposite sides of the font and prepared to enter the water, I noticed her excitement as it matched mine, and I felt united with her, seeing that she was making the right decision. This opportunity to exercise the priesthood required me to be more careful and less casual in my gospel living. In order to prepare, I went to the temple every day that week, supported by my mom, grandma, and sister, to perform baptisms for the dead. This experience taught me a lot about the priesthood and how I could exercise it worthily. I know that all priesthood holders can feel the same things I felt if we follow Nephi's example, to go and do. We cannot sit idly and expect the Lord to use us in his great work. We must not wait for those who need our aid to seek us out. It is our duty as priesthood holders to exemplify and stand as witnesses of God. If we are making decisions that inhibit us from our eternal progression, we must change now. Satan will try his hardest to keep us in a carnal state of seeking simple pleasures, but I know that if we put in the effort, find those who will support us, and repent each day, the resulting blessings will be incredible and our lives will be forever changed as we press forward on the covenant path. I know that this is the true church of Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, and has delegated the keys of the priesthood to his apostles, who use it to guide us, especially in these challenging days, and to prepare the world for his return. I know that Joseph Smith was the prophet of the Restoration and that President Nelson is our living prophet today. I invite all of us to study the lives of these great priesthood holders and seek to improve ourselves daily so we can be ready to meet our Maker. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Dear wonderful sisters and brothers, it is a delight to be with you tonight. Wherever you're listening, I extend hugs to my sisters and heartfelt heartfelt handshakes to my brothers. We are united in the work of the Lord. When we think of Adam and Eve, often our first thought is of their idyllic life in the Garden of Eden. I imagine that the weather was always perfect, not too hot and not too cold, and that abundant delicious fruits and vegetables grew within reach so they could eat whenever they liked. Since this was a new world for them, there was much to discover. So every day was interesting as they interacted with the animal life and explored their beautiful surroundings. They also were given commandments to obey and had different ways of approaching those instructions, which caused some initial anxiety and confusion. But as they made decisions that changed their lives forever, they learned to work together and became united in accomplishing the purposes God had for them and for all of his children. Now, picture this same couple in mortality. They had to labor for their food. Some of the animals considered them food. And there were difficult challenges that could be overcome only as they counseled and prayed together. I imagine that there were at least a few times they had differing opinions about how to approach those challenges. However, through the fall, they had learned that it was essential to act in unity and love. In the tutoring they received from divine sources, they were taught the plan of salvation and the principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ that make the plan operable. Because they understood that their earthly purpose and eternal goal were identical, they found satisfaction and success in learning to labor in love and righteousness together. As children were born to them, Adam and Eve taught their family what they had learned from heavenly messengers they were focused on helping their children also understand and embrace those principles that would make them happy in this life 
as well as prepared to return to their heavenly parents after having increased their abilities and proved their obedience to God. In the process, Adam and Eve learned to appreciate their differing strengths and supported one another in their eternally significant work. As centuries and then millennia came and went, the clarity of men's and women's inspired and interdependent contributions became clouded with misinformation and misunderstandings. During the time between that marvelous beginning in the Garden of Eden and now, the adversary has been quite successful in his goal to divide men and women in his attempts to conquer our souls. Lucifer knows that if he can damage the unity men and women feel, if he can confuse us about our divine worth and covenant responsibilities, he will succeed in destroying families, which are the essential units of eternity. Satan incites comparison as a tool to create feelings of being superior or inferior, hiding the eternal truth that men's and women's innate differences are God-given and equally valued. He has attempted to demean women's contributions both to the family and in civil society, thereby decreasing their uplifting influence for good. <clears throat> His goal has been to foster a power struggle rather than a celebration of the unique contributions of men and women that complement one another and contribute to unity. So, over the years and around the globe, a full understanding of the divinely interdependent and yet differing contributions and responsibilities of women and men largely disappeared. Females in many societies became subservient to males rather than side-by-side -side partners, their activities limited to a narrow scope. Spiritual progress slowed to a trickle during those dark times. Indeed, little spiritual light could penetrate minds and hearts steeped in traditions of dominance. And then the light of the restored gospel shone above the brightness of the sun when God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ appeared to the boy Joseph Smith early in the spring of 1820 in that hallowed woodland in upstate New York. That event began a modern outpouring of revelation from heaven. One of the first elements of Christ's original church to be restored was the authority of the priesthood of God. As the restoration continued to unfold, men and women began to realize anew the importance and potential of working as partners, authorized and directed in this sacred labor by Him. In 1842, when the women of the fledgling church wanted to form an official group to help in the work, President Joseph Smith felt inspired to organize them under the priesthood after the pattern of the priesthood. He said, I now turn the key to you in the name of God. This is the beginning of better days. And since that key was turned, educational, political, and economic opportunities for women have begun to gradually expand throughout the world. This new church organization for women, named the Relief Society, was unlike other women's societies of the day because it was established by a prophet who acted with priesthood authority to give women authority, sacred responsibilities, and official positions within the structure of the church, not apart from it. From the prophet Joseph Smith's day to ours, the ongoing restoration of all things has brought enlightenment on the necessity of the authority and power of the priesthood in helping both men and women accomplish their divinely appointed responsibilities. Recently, we have been taught that women who are set apart under the direction of one holding priesthood keys operate with priesthood authority in their callings. In October 2019, President Russell M. Nelson taught that women who are endowed in the temple have priesthood power in their lives and in their homes as they keep those sacred covenants they made with God. He explained that the heavens are just as open to women who are endowed with God's power flowing from their priesthood covenants as they are to men who bear the priesthood, end quote. And he encouraged every sister to draw liberally upon the Savior's power to help your family and others you love. So what does that mean for you and me? How does understanding priesthood authority and power change our lives? One of the keys is to understand that when women and men work together, we accomplish a great deal more than we do working separately. Our roles are complementary rather than competitive. Although women are not ordained to a priesthood office, as noted previously, women are blessed with priesthood power as they keep their covenants, and they operate with priesthood authority when they are set apart to a calling. 
On a lovely August day, I was privileged to sit down with President Russell M. Nelson in the reconstructed home of Joseph and Emma Smith in Harmony, Pennsylvania, near where the Aaronic Priesthood was restored in these latter days. In our conversation, President Nelson talked about the important role women played in the Restoration. One of the most important aspects that I am reminded of when they come to this restoration of the priesthood site is the important role that women played in the restoration. When Joseph first started to translate the Book of Mormon, who did the writing? Well, he did a little, but not much. Emma stepped in. And then I think of Joseph went into the woods to pray near their home in Palmyra, New York. Where did he go? He went to the Sacred Grove. Why did he go there? Because that's where Mother went when she wanted to pray. Those are just two of the women who had key roles in the restoration of the priesthood and, the, and in the restoration of the church. No doubt we could say our wives are just as important today as they were then, of course they are. Like Emma and Lucy and Joseph, we are most effective when we are willing to learn from one another and are united in our goal to become disciples of Jesus Christ and help others along that path. We are taught that priesthood blesses the lives of God's children in innumerable ways. In church callings, temple ordinances, family relationships, and quiet individual ministry, Latter-day Saint women and men go forward with priesthood power and authority. The interdependence of men and women in accomplishing God's work through His power is central to the gospel of Jesus Christ, restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. Unity is essential to the divine work we are privileged and called to do, but it doesn't just happen. It takes effort and time to really counsel together, to listen to one another, understand one another's viewpoints, and share experiences, but the process results in more inspired decisions. Whether at home or in our church responsibilities, the most effective way to fulfill our divine potential is to work together, blessed by the power and authority of the priesthood, in our differing yet complementary roles. What does that partnership look like in the lives of covenant women today? Let me share an example. Allison and John had a partnership that was unique. They rode a tandem bicycle in races short and long. To successfully compete on that vehicle, the two riders must be in harmony. They have to lean in the same direction at the right time. One cannot dominate the other, but they must communicate clearly and each do his or her part. The captain in front has control over when to brake and when to stand. The stoker in the back needs to pay attention to what is going on and be ready to give extra power if they lag behind a little or ease up if they get too close to other cyclists. They must support one another to make progress and achieve their goal. Allison explained, For the first little while, the person in the captain position would say, Stand! when he needed to stand and braking when he needed to stop pedaling. After a while, the person who was a stoker learned to tell when the captain was about to stand or brake and no words needed to be said. We learned to be in tune to how each other was doing and could tell when one was struggling and then the other tried to pick up the slack. It's really all about trust and working together. John and Allison were united not only as they pedaled their bicycle, but they were united in their marriage as well. Each desired the happiness of the other more than his or her own. Each looked for the good in one another and worked to overcome the not so great in him or herself. They took turns leading and took turns giving more when one partner was struggling. Each valued the other's contributions and found better answers to their challenges as they combined their talents and resources. They are truly bound to one another through Christ-like love. Becoming more in tune with the divine pattern of working together in unity is critical in this day of me-first messages that surround us. Women do possess distinctive divine gifts and are given unique responsibilities, but those are not more or less important than men's gifts and responsibilities. All are designed and needed to bring about Heavenly Father's divine plan to give each of His children the best opportunity to fulfill his or her divine potential. Today, we need women who have the courage and vision of our Mother Eve 
to unite with their brethren in bringing souls unto Christ. Men need to become true partners rather than assume they are solely responsible or act as pretend partners while women carry out much of the work. Women need to be willing to step forward and take their rightful and needful place as partners rather than thinking they need to do it all by themselves or wait to be told what to do. Seeing women as vital participants is not about creating parity, but about understanding doctrinal truth. Rather than establishing a program to bring that about, we can actively work to devalue women as God does, as essential partners in the work of salvation and exaltation. Are we ready? Will we strive to overcome cultural bias and instead embrace divine patterns and practices based on foundational doctrine? President Russell M. Nelson invites us to walk arm in arm in this sacred work to help prepare the world for the second coming of the Lord. As we do, we will learn to value each individual's contributions and increase the effectiveness with which we fulfill our divine roles. We will feel greater joy than we have ever experienced. May each of us choose to become united in the Lord's inspired way to help His work go forward. In the name of our beloved Amen. Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you for these inspired and useful messages. The congregation will now join the choir in singing, I am a child of God. After the singing, we will hear from President Henry B. Eyring, second counselor in the First Presidency. It will then be my privilege to address you. This is the 190th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.
my beloved brothers and sisters, I am grateful to be with you in this general conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. In his invitation to reflect on the way the Lord's restoration of his church in this dispensation has blessed us and our loved ones, President Russell M. Nelson promised that our experience would be not only memorable, but unforgettable. My experience has been memorable, as I'm sure yours has been. Whether it will be unforgettable depends on each one of us. That matters to me because the experience of preparing for this conference has changed me in a way that I want to last. Let me explain. My preparation took me to the record of an event in the Restoration. I had read about that event many times, but it had always been to me a report of an important meeting that involves Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Restoration. But this time, I saw in the account how the Lord leads us, his disciples, in his church. I saw what it means for us mortals to be led by the Savior of the world, the Creator, who knows all things past, present, and future. He teaches us step by step and guides us, never forcing. The meeting I'm describing was a pivotal moment in the Restoration. It was a Sabbath day. It was a meeting held on April 3rd, 1836 in the Kirtland Temple in Ohio, seven days after it was dedicated. Joseph Smith described this great moment in the history of the world in a simple way. Much of his account is recorded in Doctrine and Covenants, section 110. In the afternoon, I assisted the other presidents in distributing the Lord's Supper to the church, receiving it from the 12, whose privilege it was to officiate at the sacred desk this day. After having performed this service to my brethren, I retired to the pulpit, the veils being dropped, and bowed myself with Oliver Cowdery in solemn and silent prayer. After rising from prayer, the following vision was opened to both of us. The veil was taken from our minds, and the eyes of our understanding were opened. We saw the Lord standing upon the breastwork of the pulpit before us, and under his feet was a paved work of pure gold in color like amber. His eyes were as a flame of fire. The hair of his head was white like the pure snow. His countenance shone above the brightness of the sun, and his voice was as the sound of the rushing of great waters, even the voice of Jehovah saying, I am the first and the last. I am he who liveth. I am he who was slain. I am your advocate with the Father. Behold, your sins are forgiven you. You are clean before me. Therefore, lift up your heads and rejoice. Let the hearts of your brethren rejoice, and let the hearts of all my people rejoice, who have with this their might built this house to my name. Behold, I have accepted this house, and my name shall be here, and I will manifest myself to my people in mercy in this house. Yea, I will appear unto my servants and speak unto them, with mine own voice, if my people will keep my commandments and do not pollute this holy house. Yea, the hearts of thousands and tens of thousands shall greatly rejoice in consequence of the blessings which shall be poured out and the endowment with which my servants have been endowed in this house. And the fame of this house shall spread to foreign lands and this is the beginning of the blessing which shall be poured out upon the heads of my people, even so, amen. After this vision closed, the heavens were again opened unto us, and Moses appeared before us and committed unto us the keys of the gathering of Israel from the four parts of the earth and the leading of the ten tribes from the land of the north. 
After this, Elias appeared and committed the dispensation of the gospel of Abraham, saying that in us and our seed all generations after us should be blessed. After this vision had closed, another great and glorious vision burst upon us. For Elijah the prophet, who was taken to heaven without tasting death, stood before us and said, Behold, the time has fully come, which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, and by this you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. Now I had read that account many times. The Holy Ghost had confirmed to me that the account was true, but as I studied and prepared for this conference, I came to see more clearly the power of the Lord to lead his disciples in his work. Seven years before Moses committed to Joseph the keys of the gathering of Israel in the Curtain Temple, Joseph learned from the title page of the Book of Mormon that its purpose was to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel that they may know the covenants of the Lord that they are not cast off forever. In 1831, the Lord told Joseph that the gathering of Israel would commence in Kirtland, and from thence, whosoever shall go forth among all nations, for Israel shall be saved, and I will lead them. Although missionary work was needed to gather Israel, the Lord taught the twelve, who became some of our early missionaries, remember, you are not to go to other nations till you receive your endowment. It seems that the Kirtland Temple was important to the Lord's step-by-step -step plan for at least two reasons. First, Moses waited until the temple was completed to restore the keys of the gathering of Israel. And second, President Joseph Fielding Smith taught that the Lord commanded the saints to build a temple in which he could reveal the keys of authority and where the apostles could be endowed and prepared to prune his vineyard for the last time. Although the Temple of Dalman, as we know it, wasn't administered in the Kirtland Temple, in fulfillment of prophecy, preparatory temple ordinances began to be introduced there, along with an outpouring of spiritual manifestations which armed those called on missions with the promised endowment of power from on high that led to a great gathering through missionary service after the keys of gathering of Israel were committed to Joseph, the Lord inspired the prophet to send out members of the Twelve on missions. As I studied, it became clear to me that the Lord had prepared in detail the way for the Twelve to go on missions abroad where people had been prepared to believe and sustain them. In time, thousands would through them be brought into the Lord's restored church. According to our records, it is estimated that between 7,500 and 8,000 were baptized during the two missions of the Twelve to the British Isles. This laid the foundation for missionary work in Europe. By the end of the 19th century, some 90,000 had gathered to America, with most of those coming from the British Isles and Scandinavia. The Lord had inspired Joseph and those faithful missionaries who went to work to achieve a harvest that must have at the time seemed beyond them. But the Lord, with his perfect foresight and preparation, made it possible. You remember the apparently simple and almost poetic language from section 110 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Behold, the time has fully come which was spoken of by the mouth of Malachi, testifying that he, Elijah, should be sent before the great and dreadful day of the Lord to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children of the fathers, lest the whole earth be smitten with a curse. Therefore, the keys of this dispensation are committed into your hands, 
And by this you may know that the great and dreadful day of the Lord is near, even at the doors. I testify that the Lord saw far into the future, and he saw how he would lead us to help him accomplish his purposes in the last days. For instance, while I was serving in the presiding bishopric many years ago, I was charged with overseeing the design and development group that created what we named Family Search. Now, I'm careful to say that I oversaw its creation rather than saying I directed it. Many brilliant people left careers and came to build what the Lord wanted, and the Lord led it. The First Presidency had set a goal of reducing the duplication of ordinances. Their major concern was our being unable to know whether a person's ordinance had already been performed. For years, or what seemed like years, the First President asked me in a penetrating voice, when will you have it done? With prayer, diligence, and the personal sacrifice of people of great ability, the task that they had given was accomplished. It came step by step. And then the task was to make family search more user-friendly for those who are not comfortable with computers. More changes came, and I know they will continue to come. For whenever we proceed to resolve one inspired problem, we open the door for further revelation, for advancements at least equally important, but not yet seen. Even today, family search is becoming what the Lord needs for part of his restoration and not just for avoiding duplication of ordinances. The Lord lets us make improvements to help people gain feelings of familiarity and even love for their ancestors and to complete their temple ordinances. Now, as the Lord surely knew would happen, young people are becoming computer mentors to their parents and ward members. All have found great joy in their service. The spirit of Elijah is changing the hearts of young and old, children and parents, grandchildren and grandparents. Temples will soon again be happily scheduling baptismal opportunities and other sacred ordinances, the desire to serve our ancestors, and the bonding of parents and children are growing. The Lord saw it all coming. He planned for it, step by step, as he has done with other changes in his church. He has raised up and prepared faithful people who choose to do hard things well. He has always been loving and patient in helping us learn line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. He is, firming, he is firm in the timing and the sequence of his intentions, yet he ensures that sacrifice often brings continuing blessings that we did not foresee. I close by expressing my gratitude to the Lord. He who inspired President Nelson to invite me to make a sacrifice to prepare for this conference. Every hour and every prayer during my preparation brought a blessing. I invite all who hear this message or read these words to have faith that the Lord is leading the restoration of his gospel and his church. He goes before us. He knows the future perfectly. He invites you to the work. He joins you in it. He has in place a plan for your service. He loves you. And even as you sacrifice, you will feel joy as you help others rise to be ready for his coming. I testify to you that God the Father lives Jesus is the Christ. This is his church. He knows you. He guides you in the service of this kingdom of God. I bear you my testimony that he loves you, that he has prepared the way for you. He goes before your face in every service you give to him. In the sacred name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, President Eyring. I have chosen to speak further about the priesthood of God. 
the subject already addressed by three earlier speakers who taught us about how the priesthood blesses the lives of women, young women, and young men. The priesthood is a divine power and authority held in trust to be used for God's work for the benefit of all of his children. Priesthood is not those who have been ordained to a priesthood office or those who exercise its authority. Men who hold the priesthood are not the priesthood. While we should not refer to ordained men as the priesthood, it is appropriate to refer to them as holders of the priesthood. The power of the priesthood exists both in the church and in the family organization. But priesthood power and priesthood authority function differently in the church than they do in the family. All of this is according to the principles the Lord has established. The purpose of God's plan is to lead his children to eternal life. Mortal families are essential to that plan. The church exists to provide the doctrine, the authority, and the ordinances necessary to perpetuate family relationships into the eternities. Thus, the family organization and the Church of Jesus Christ have a mutually reinforcing relationship. The blessings of the priesthood such as the fullness of the gospel and ordinances like baptism, confirmation and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, the temple endowment, and eternal marriage, are available to men and women alike. The priesthood we speak of here is the Melchizedek priesthood, restored at the beginning of the restoration of the gospel. Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery were ordained by Peter, James, and John, who declared themselves as possessing the keys of the kingdom and of the dispensation of the fullness of times. These senior apostles received that authority from the Savior himself. All other authorities or offices in the priesthood are appendages to the Melchizedek priesthood, for it holds the right of presidency, and has power and authority over all the offices in the church in all ages of the world." End of quote. In the church, the authority of the greater priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, and the lesser or Aaronic priesthood is exercised under the direction of a priesthood leader, like a bishop or president, who holds the keys of that priesthood. To understand the exercise of priesthood authority in the church, we must understand the principle of priesthood keys. The Melchizedek priesthood keys of the kingdom were conferred by Peter, James, and John, but that did not complete the restoration of priesthood keys. Some keys of the priesthood came later. Following the dedication of the first temple of this dispensation in Kirtland, Ohio, three prophets, Moses, Elias, and Elijah, restored the keys of this dispensation, including keys pertaining to the gathering of Israel and the work of the temples of the Lord, as President Eyring has explained to us so persuasively. The most familiar example of the function of keys is in the performance of priesthood ordinances. An ordinance is a solemn act signifying the making of covenants and the promising of blessings. In the church, all ordinances are performed under the authorization of the priesthood leader who holds the keys for that ordinance. An ordinance is most commonly officiated by persons who have been ordained to an office in the priesthood acting under the direction of one who holds priesthood keys. For example, the holders of the various offices of the Aaronic priesthood officiate in the ordinance of the sacrament under the keys and direction of the bishop who holds the keys of the Aaronic priesthood. 
The same principle applies to the priesthood ordinances in which women officiate in the temple. Though women do not hold an office in the priesthood, they perform sacred temple ordinances under the authorization of the president of the temple, who holds the keys for the ordinances of the temple. Another example of priesthood authority under the direction of one who holds the keys are the teachings of men and women called to teach the gospel, whether in classes in their home wards or in the mission field. Other examples are those who hold leadership positions in the ward and exercise priesthood authority in their leadership by reason of their callings and under the setting apart and direction of the priesthood leader who holds the keys in the ward or the stake. This is how the authority and power of the priesthood is exercised and enjoyed in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Priesthood authority is also exercised and its blessings realized in the families of Latter-day Saints. By families, I mean a priesthood-holding man and a woman who are married and their children. I also include the variations from the ideal relationship, such as caused by death or divorce. The principle that priesthood authority can be exercised only under the direction of one who holds the keys for that function is fundamental in the church, but this does not apply in the family. For example, a father presides and exercises the priesthood in his family by the authority of the priesthood he holds. He has no need to have the direction or approval of one holding priesthood keys in order to perform his various family functions. These include counseling the members of his family, holding family meetings, giving priesthood blessings to his wife and children, or giving healing blessings to family members or others. Church authorities teach family members but do not direct the exercise of priesthood authority in the family. The same principle applies when a father is absent and a mother is the family leader. She presides in her home and is instrumental in bringing the power and blessings of the priesthood into her family through her endowment and sealing in the temple. While she is not authorized to give the priesthood blessings that can only be given by a person holding a certain office in the priesthood, she can perform all of the other functions of family leadership. In doing so, she exercises the power of the priesthood for the benefit of the children over whom she presides in her position of leadership in the family. If fathers would magnify their priesthood in their own family, it would further the mission of the church as much as anything else they might do. Fathers who hold the Melchizedek priesthood should exercise their authority by persuasion, by long-suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned. That high standard for the exercise of all priesthood authority is most important in the family. Holders of the priesthood should also keep the commandments so they will have the power of the priesthood to give blessings to their family members. They should cultivate loving family relationships so that family members will want to ask them for blessings. And parents should encourage more priesthood blessings in the family. In these conference meetings, as we seek brief shelter from our mortal concerns with a devastating pandemic, we've been taught great principles of eternity. I encourage each of us to have our eye single to receive these truths of eternity so that our bodies shall be full of light. In his sermon to multitudes recorded in the Bible and in the Book of Mormon, the Savior taught that mortal bodies can be full of light or full of darkness. We, of course, want to be filled with light 
and our Savior taught us how we can make this happen. We should listen to messages about the truths of eternity. He used the example of our eye, through which we take light into our bodies. If our eye be single, in other words, if we are concentrating on receiving eternal light and understanding, he explained, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if our eye be evil, that is, if we look for evil and take that into our bodies, he warned, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. In other words, the light or darkness in our bodies depends on how we see or receive the eternal truths we are taught. We should follow the Savior's invitation to seek and ask to understand the truths of eternity. He promises that our Father in heaven is willing to teach everyone the truths they seek. If we desire this and have our eyes single to receive, the Savior promises that the truths of eternity shall be opened unto us. In contrast, Satan is anxious to confuse our thinking or to lead us astray on important matters like the operations of the priesthood of God. The Savior warned of such false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. He gave us this test to help us choose the truth from among different teachings that might confuse us. Ye shall know them by their fruits, he taught. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Therefore, we should look to the results, the fruits of principles that are taught and the persons who teach them. That is the best answer to many of the objections we hear against the church and its doctrines and policies and leadership. Follow the test the Savior taught. Look to the fruits, the results. When we think of the fruits of the gospel and the restored church of Jesus Christ, we rejoice in how the church, in the lifetimes of its living members, has expanded from local congregations in the Intermountain West to where a majority of its more than 16 million members reside in nations other than the United States. With that growth, we have felt increases in the church's capacity to assist its members. We assist in keeping the commandments, in fulfilling responsibilities to preach the restored gospel, in gathering Israel, and in building temples throughout the world. We are led by a prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, whose leadership the Lord has used to achieve the progress we have felt during all of the more than two years of his leadership. Now we will be blessed to hear from President Nelson, who will teach us how to further our progress in this restored Church of Jesus Christ in these challenging times. I testify of the truth of these things and join you in praying for our prophet, from whom we will next hear. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. The concluding speaker for this session will be our beloved prophet, President Russell M. Nelson. Following his remarks, the choir will close this meeting by singing, Hark, All Ye Nations. The benediction will then be offered by Sister Christina B. Franco, second counselor in the primary general presidency. What a unique and wonderful session this has been. Thank you, dear Laudi and Ensel. You represented the magnificent young women and young men of the church so very well. My dear brothers and sisters, we have heard much today about the restoration of the church, the very church that our Savior Jesus Christ established during his earthly ministry. 
That restoration began 200 years ago this spring when God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ appeared to the young Joseph Smith. Ten years after this transcendent vision, the prophet Joseph Smith and five others were called as founding members of the Lord's Restored Church. From that small group assembled on April 6, 1830, has come a global organization of more than 16 million members. The good this church accomplishes around the world to alleviate human suffering and provide uplift for humankind is widely known, but its prime purpose is to help men, women, and children follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to keep his commandments and qualify for the greatest of all blessings, that of eternal life with God and their loved ones. As we commemorate the event that was launched in 1820, it is important to remember that while we, we revere Joseph Smith as a prophet of God, this is not the Church of Joseph Smith, nor is it the Church of Mormon. This is the Church of Jesus Christ. He decried exactly what his church should be called. Quote, For thus shall my church be called in the last days, even the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Close quote. I have spoken previously about a needed course correction in the way we refer to the name of the church. Since that time, much has been done to accomplish this correction. I am very grateful to President M. Russell Ballard and the entire Quorum of the Twelve Apostles who have done so much to lead these efforts, as well as those related to another initiative that I will announce this evening. Church leaders and departments, related entities, and millions of members and others now use the correct name of the Church. The Church's official style guide has been adjusted. The pr Church's principal website is now churchofjesuschrist.org. Addresses for email, domain names, and social media channels have been updated. Our beloved choir is now the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. We have gone to these extraordinary efforts because when we remove the Lord's name from the name of his church, we inadvertently remove him as the central focus of our worship and our lives. When we take the Savior's name upon us at baptism, we commit to witness by our words, thoughts, and actions that Jesus is the Christ. Previously, I promised that if we would do our best to restore the correct name of the Lord's Church, He would pour down His power and blessings upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints, the likes of which we have never seen. I renew that promise today. To help us remember Him and to identify the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as the Lord's Church, we are pleased to introduce a symbol that will signify the central place of Jesus Christ in his church. This symbol includes the name of the church contained within a cornerstone. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. At the center of the symbol is a representation of Torvaldsen's marble statue, the Christus. It portrays the resurrected living Lord reaching out to embrace all who will come unto him. Symbolically, Jesus Christ is standing under an arch. The arch reminds us of the resurrected Savior emerging from the tomb on the third day following his crucifixion. This symbol should feel familiar to many as we have long identified the restored gospel with the living resurrected Christ. The symbol will now be used as a visual identifier for official literature, news, and events of the Church. 
It will remind all that this is the Savior's church and that all we do as members of his church centers on Jesus Christ and his gospel. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, tomorrow is Palm Sunday, as Elder Gong has so eloquently taught. Then we enter this special week that culminates with Easter. As followers of Jesus Christ, living in a day when the COVID-19 pandemic has put the whole world in commotion, let us not just talk of Christ or preach of Christ or employ a symbol representing Christ. Let us put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ into action. As you know, members of the church observe the law of the fast one day each month. The doctrine of fasting is ancient. It has been practiced by biblical heroes from the earliest days Moses, David, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Isaiah, Daniel, Joel, and many others fasted and preached of fasting. Through Isaiah's writings, the Lord said, quote, Is not this the fast that I have chosen? To loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens, and to let the oppressed go free." Close quote. The Apostle Paul admonished saints in Corinth to give yourselves to fasting and prayer. The Savior himself declared that certain things go not out but by prayer and fasting. I said recently in a social media video that as a physician and surgeon, I have tremendous respect for medical professionals, scientists, and others who are working around the clock to curb the spread of COVID-19. Now as president of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and an apostle of Jesus Christ, I know that God has all power, all wisdom, and all understanding. He comprehendeth all things, and he is a merciful being, even unto salvation, to those who will repent and believe on his name. So during times of deep distress, as when illness reaches pandemic proportions, the most natural thing for us to do is to call upon our Heavenly Father and His Son, the Master Healer, to show forth their marvelous power to bless the people of the earth. In my video message, I invited all to join in fasting on Sunday, March 29th, 2020. Many of you may have seen the video and joined in the fast. Some may have not. Now we still need help from heaven. So tonight, my dear brothers and sisters, in the spirit of the sons of Mosiah who gave themselves to much fasting and prayer, and as part of our April 2020 General Conference, I am calling for another worldwide fast. For all whose health may permit, let us fast, pray, and unite our faith once again let us prayerfully plead for relief from this global pandemic. I invite all, including those not of our faith, to fast and pray on Good Friday, April 10th, that the present pandemic may be controlled, caregivers protected, the economy strengthened, and life normalized. How do we fast? Two meals or a period of 24 hours is customary. But you decide what would constitute a sacrifice for you as you remember the supreme sacrifice the Savior made for you. Let us unite in pleading for healing throughout the world. 
Good Friday would be the perfect day to have our Heavenly Father and His Son hear us. Dear brothers and sisters, I express my deep love for you, along with my testimony of the divinity of the work in which we are engaged. This is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He stands at its head and directs all that we do. I know that he will respond to the pleadings of his people. I so testify in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Our dear Father in heaven, at this bicentennial celebration of thine and thy son's visitation to Joseph Smith, we give these thanks for the restoration of the Church of Jesus Christ and for the blessings of the gospel in our lives. Father, we are grateful for our Savior Jesus Christ, for his example in our lives and his atoning sacrifice in our behalf. 
Will thou please help us, Father, to remember him in our daily lives and to hear him. Father, we are grateful for a living prophet, even Russell M. Nelson, and we're grateful for his guidance and direction, and uh, we want to express our love to him. And also, Father, we are grateful for his counselors and for the Quorum of the Twelve. And for them and their families, we pray. Father, we, at this difficult time, we pray for all those who are sick and afflicted from this worldwide pandemic, that they may be healed and that they may find comfort in Thee. Father, we Pray for the missionary force, that they may be protected and guided to continue to find thy sons and daughters throughout the world. Now as we close this meeting, we ask thee, Father, to help us prepare for tomorrow. Help us to ponder all the inspire messages that we've heard that we may have the influence of the Holy Ghost that we may be enlightened tomorrow in tomorrow's sessions. We express our love and our gratitude, Father, unto thee and unto thy Son. In the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. This has been a broadcast of the 190th Annual General Conference of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Music was provided by the Tabernacle Choir at Temple Square. This broadcast has been furnished as a public service by Bonneville Distribution. Any reproduction, recording, transcription, or other use of this program without written consent is prohibited.